Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Two Foot Tackle podcast. I'm your host, Aris Matakos, and this is episode three of the new season. Thank you all very much for joining me once again. If this is your first podcast, thank you, thank you very much for coming, and also, of course, subscribe on YouTube, like the podcast, and of course, all the audio platforms: Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcast, Anchor, all the socials, the whole nine yards. You guys know what to do. But um, I hope everyone's well. Premier League is back, football is back. How good is it? Uh, how good is it having, having the elites of the elite back and having just football for days to to sink our teeth into? It is very very good to watch, very good to see, very good to experience. So let's crack into it. Hope everyone's well as always. Always everyone's well. Everyone wants to be well. No, everyone wants to have a good week. I hope your team won. Unless it's evident, then I'm glad your team lost. And unless it's United, then that just made me laugh. And we'll touch on United, but that made me laugh. Um, Spurs won, unfortunately. Um, I shouldn't say that, but as a Chelsea supporter, I would love to have seen them lose. But they won in convincing fashion, so good on them. Liverpool fell a little bit, dropping points early on. I'm not really sure it's something that they need to be worried about as such because there is still a long, long way to go. And, of course, City... Beat West Ham at a canter, really, which we won't really touch on because it was really simple for City. 2-0, Hall and Brace, no danger at all, no injuries, I don't think, just easy stuff. But let's start, and there's two teams I want to touch on in particular today, Premier League-wise. That's Arsenal, and that's Manchester United. Now, as you can tell by the title, we're going to be answering the question who was the most impressive team over the first week of the Premier League season. Now, I, I guess you can you can kind of deduce which team it is considering we're touching on Arsenal and United, and United were anything but impressive. So we are talking about Arsenal, or I am talking about Arsenal anyway. And I feel like it's important to give credit where credit, credit to due because, I mean, let's just start talking about them straight away. I was a critic. I was a critic. I was a skeptic. I think that's not... That is very well-known public knowledge that I, w- I was a critic. I was a skeptic of Mikel Arteta and I was kind of just really waiting to see whether or not what he would do would work because there is a lot of kind of figuring it out with Arteta and with his system. And what I was looking at is, is there going to be an improvement? Because it's all good stagnating. And I feel like a lot of people thought that Arsenal would stagnate um, this in terms of their play style would kind of just maintain what and what it what it was, and the personnel would got better. That's what I was looking at. If I saw that, I would think danger signs. If I just saw the same way of playing football, just with better players, I'd I'd be worried. If I was an Arsenal supporter, so I I wake up at five a.m. Glorious, glorious Saturday morning. Um, e- eagerly awaiting Crystal Palace versus Arsenal and eagerly awaiting Crystal Palace to do what Brentford did last season, which unfortunately didn't come to be. But I was really, really interested to see how Arsenal played. I was very, very intrigued. Now, like I said, they obviously got in the signings of Jesus and Zinchenko, both players started. Um, Fabio Vieira didn't feature, Marquinhos didn't feature, all the other big signings didn't feature, unless you count Saliba. But he's, yeah, Saliba, why not? He's a new player. He featured as well. He played the whole game and was fantastic, by the way. So I was inter- interested to see whether or not their game style had developed. Now, it, it was immediate from from the first minute that Arsenal were a different team this season. Well, they looked to be a different team anyway. They were quick. They were energised. They w- were passing in patterns. They were attacking as a unit. There was four or five or six players on the offence every single time they got in the final third even or even the middle third. So it was promising signs on that perspective. And when you look at the players that played... It was kind of a. It was kind of a. All right, who's going to step up and who's going to really announce themselves? Because I feel like at the start of every season, there's a player from each team that kind of makes the game their own in a sense. And they started with Martinelli on the left, Saka on the right, a double pivot of Xhaka and Thomas Partey with Martin Odegaard slightly ahead, um, if you were to call it that, or it was a four three three four two three one, a similar system. Now. Now, obviously, with Tommy Yasu being unfit or being injured or not being available to play, it was Ben White starting at right fullback. Now, that in itself interests me because 
we have saw last year without Tomoyasu that we're lacking in that right-back area. I don't think Cedric's good enough. I don't think Hector Bellerin's good enough at Premier League level anyway. So... It was interest. I was interesting to interested to see how Ben White would do and how Arteta would kind of go about having Ben White as a centre back. Now Ben White and Tomiyasu are very similar players in terms of the way they defend, and in terms of the way that they offer that elbow style formation, or allowing Arsenal to have an elbow style formation with having the third, with having the right back or either full back coming inside and acting as a third centre back, giving the license to the left back to really bomb on, right? So. I was interested to see whether or not it'd be the same thing, and shock horror, it was, so I wasn't overly surprised there. And I was interested to see how Zinchenko would go, because I thought he would start in midfield, personally. I thought they would go for a Jacques, uh, they would go for a Partey um, Zinchenko double pivot. They didn't, they went with Granit Xhaka, and it worked out. I don't think any Arsenal fans can critique that um, selection by any means. Zinchenko obviously played on the left-hand side and played very well, but... Let's get into the proper analysis by bringing up the average positions. So, as we can see here, it is very typical of a 4-3-3, 4-2-3-1 type system. Now, what springs to mind straight away is the way Arsenal have set up here with the two centre-backs, the two full-backs, and the four up front type system is very similar to the way Spain set up. And obviously, we know Mikel Arteta is came through La Masia and has is heavily involved and heavily in, intricized. Is that even a word? Or heavily um, linked with the Spanish system, and especially under what Luis Enrique is doing with the national team. And the way Spain play is almost like that is kind of a more fulfilled version of this. So if Spain set up in a four three three, but transitioned to a two four four in in offense, right? And you can see a little bit of that here with obviously Saliba and Gabriel playing as those two center halves with Ben White and Zinchenko being in line with a double pivot. That is a big feature of it. Now, what this offers, if we just bring it up, I feel like it's easier to illustrate here. What this offers is almost an offensive bank of four. So it kind of, it's allowing you to play a two banks of four, but in a much more offensive and much more direct way. Having these players in more advanced positions as well, you obviously want Zinchenko in more advanced positions because of the attacking and offensive um, qualities that he possess. But it also gives freedom to the likes of of the front four because they know they've got more security just behind them. Whereas if it was a traditional, maybe maybe it was a 4-4-2, but it went to a 4-2-4, the front four would have to be more conservative with the way that they press or conservative with the way that they hold possession because they know if they turn the ball over, they've got only got two men in midfield that have to deal with maybe three or four opposition midfielders. Because you have that that four four in offense in like the front line and the middle third, you have four, two banks of four there. That allows for more solidity going forward and allows for more freedom going forward. Now, the star of the show, we all know Gabriel Jesus, his quality, and we all know that what he was able to produce um, on on well, Saturday morning for us, but on the first game week. And he was very exciting. I don't think there's any doubts. But there was something left to be desired, in my opinion. And it was, he was a little bit restricted. Now, if you bring up the average positions here, you can quite clearly see that he's playing as a number nine, right? So with that, there's certain limitations and certain mitigating factors to being a number nine. Firstly, you have to stay there. There isn't a lot of freedom, especially in a system that doesn't implement a false nine. There's not a lot of freedom when you play as an as a out-and-out striker. And what Gabriel Jesus' biggest strength, in my opinion, is is his creative flair. He's just so creative with the ball. And I know we saw glimpses of that, especially early on, when he got onto that ball, when he got onto the ball, I think it was within the first couple of minutes, drove to the defense, cut inside one, got past another, and got I think he got a shot off, which was saved in the end. But... There, there was that creativity there, but that was coming off the right-hand side. And that is where I want to see Jesus more. If Where um, Bakaya Saka is, that's where I would love to see Jesus because I feel like they could get so much more out of him. I know I spoke about this preseason, but having him being able to cut inside from the right or even from the left and just be that flair player, that mercurial talent, I feel like they could get more out of him. But, as we can see, he started as a number nine and he obviously played really well. So I can't even I can't even begin to question that. I'm only throwing up suggestions. He was um, he was subbed off for um, Eddie and Ketia late on. Just, I'm assuming that was for either legs purposes or just to see how it could work with Nketiah up front because I feel like Arteta wants to 
trial in Ketia up front as like a starting number nine and really giving him that mantle. So it'll be inter- interesting to see where that develops. But one of the key players for Arsenal, in my opinion, was, yeah, well, I'll touch on William Saliba a little bit later, but Martin Odegaard. Now, Martin Odegaard for me is kind of the glue that holds this together. Of course, we all know he was given the captaincy um, a couple of weeks ago. I think it might have been every last week, but I am I think I haven't spoken about this on the podcast, but I'm a little bit hesitant um, to give that decision praise just because of the nature of it. I feel like there were better choices, but he's given it, and his first performance as captain was exceptional. Now, what if we just speak to, to camera there, we'll get we'll bring up the average positions a little bit later when regards to Odegaard, but what he offered being that right-hand side kind of offensive link between the midfield third and the offensive and the attacking third is that he was able to just be free in that position while also not having a lot of he was able to be free in that position whilst also being very involved in the play one of the risks you take when giving a player free license and giving a player free roam I, I saw this with Chelsea a little bit um, when they gave, obviously, Eden Hazard, right? He was, at some points in some games, he was given license to roam. He would play out front, but he could really go anywhere. Hazard was a good enough player to pull that off nine times out of ten. However, that one game where he wasn't able to play well, he was absent. He was really absent because you have no structure to your game then. When Odegaard is given this, he was given this freedom, which I found on... um. On on against Crystal Palace. I'm just going to say Saturday morning because that's what it was for me. On Saturday morning, he was given that freedom on that right-hand side to really kind of roam wherever he wants. He was able to drop in, collect the ball from deep and dictate tempo as well as pushing up, being, a, being like a second striker almost. And he was able to be good enough to really make an impact and really pronounce himself. I'm not necessarily... He wasn't overly impactful. He didn't really... I don't think he scored or got an assist. But he he was able to just be really influential in the in the areas where he was if that makes sense so where he was every time he was around the ball something happened so that is a massive tick for me because that shows that he's able to he doesn't need to be spoon fed a role or spoon fed a position in order to play well he's able to be given a license to play and license to roam and able to take that with both hands and really drive and play well, which shows maturity and also shows class in a player because, like I said, Eden Hazard was able to do that nine times out of ten. The one game he wasn't able to do that, he was completely anonymous. Odegaard has shown that he is able to do that. Well, he definitely showed that on Saturday morning that he was able to play that free roaming role really well. So that was another plus, and I just want to touch on that's an average position from I don't even know where that, that where that average position is from or that heat map. That's nothing related to do with the podcast. I apologize, but this um, this average positions. Oh, this doesn't really matter when I speak about um, William Saliba, but he was so good on Saturday morning. He was so good because like. I spoke about this preseason. He was my player to watch out um, or like breakout player for Arsenal this season. And I think we all saw his class. I think he starts over Ben White, in my opinion. I think that's the partnership that they that they go for in the future, which is a shame because Ben White obviously has a lot of quality and really had a good battle with Wilfred Zaha on that, um, on that wing, which was exciting to see every time Zaha got the ball. And I think Ben White held his own as well, just quietly. But... I just think the Saliba Gabriel partnership, both players can really grow into their grow into their own respective roles, can really grow as players beside each other, and they both offer fantastic qualities that complement each other. So, I was really really pleased to see Saliba play really really well because we all know the quality he was really good in France last season, and he's a very he's a very good chance of being in that World Cup squad World Cup squad come November. So, I was overly pleased by his performance. I thought I thought he was the the best centre back on the day, although Anderson um, gave him a run for his money because he was phenomenal for Crystal Palace. Yakim Anderson was really, really good. So it was between them, between them two, as the best centre backs on the day. But Saliba put out every fire that was placed in front of him, and really just showed his class. Really just showed his, just showed how good he is and how well he can lead Arsenal um, in the future. So, what does this mean? For their upcoming games, uh, we all know Crystal Palace are a fantastic side, and we all know Crystal Palace will do some damage um, coming into this season. They obviously host Leicester next game, who fell to Brentford. 
who I think came from behind against them. So they drew against Brentford at home. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not um, Arsenal can continue this form. And it'll be interesting interesting to see if that slightly on a slightly more controlled way that Brendan Rodgers wants his side to play and slightly more kind of maybe not possession based football but that goal scoring aspect um whether that can put a dint in in um put a dint in Arsenal's armor obviously Leicester went with the three at the back formation as well against Brentford it'll be just interesting to see how Arteta can adapt when versing a five man defense but I think that's all on Arsenal they were exceptional um, on in the opening game, they really made up for last season's debacle and were controlled. Um, were really controlled against Crystal Palace. Granted, Palace did have some chances. Odson Edward probably should have scored that header, and Ebruche as they probably should have scored that one on one. But they didn't. Arsenal took their chances. Oh, Arsenal took its chances, and that's all she wrote. Really, two 0 top of the league. I'm not sure that they aren't top of the league as it stands, but they were for a while, which um, would be pleasing to see for all Arsenal supporters. But that was a good game to start the Premier League season. I lived up to a lot. The Palace fans were in full voice as always. And what we were expecting to see from another team in the comp in the league, we didn't get to see. Now, Arsenal were kind of a little bit of a dark horse. No one really knew, no one really knew what to expect. And another dark horse or an, another kind of unorthodox team was Manchester United. Now, they fell um, quite poorly and in quite, I, I, I wouldn't say embarrassing fashion, but quite underwhelming fashion against Brighton and Hove Albion. Now, we all know how much I love Brighton and we all know how much I love Graham Potter and we all know how much I think that Brighton side is actually very good. <laughs> is actually very good despite the losses of Cucurella, which I'll touch on a little bit later because it happened after last week's episode, which was very frustrating. Um, despite the losses of Cucurella and despite the losses of, Ye- of the loss of Yves Basuma, I had no doubt in my mind that Brighton were able, will be able to to play well because they're just such a well-coached team. They're such a well-drilled team. And there's just something about them that gives me so much confidence in every single game that they play. Potter has his team playing fantastic football. They played a very weird formation as well. It was almost like a pseudo three at the back type system with Veltman almost pushing on as an overlapping fullback. Trossard on the left hand side, very getting very involved. Pas- getting very involved. Pascal Gross getting very involved. And what Brighton showed to me was a team that, regardless of personnel, knows what role that they need to play. And some of the best teams in the world, and the best teams in sport, aren't super, aren't teams full of superstars. They're superstar teams. And what being a superstar team entails is understanding your role and being able to just complete your role. Because if 11 men or 11 women or 11 players, five players in basketball, 18 players in AFL, whoever many players in whoever in whatever sport, if they just complete their role, then the team will win. If 11 players do their role to close to 100% ability, they'll win the game because that's how it works. So that's a real team mentality that I think Graham Potter has instilled into Brighton and has instilled fantastically because we saw, I think a lot of people were like, oh, Cucurella's gone, Basuma's gone, like danger signs. But all of a sudden, Trossard steps up, Solly March steps up, Caicedo steps up, like Pascal Gross steps up, McAllister steps up, Veltman steps up. These guys just step up because they know what their role is. And it is a kind of a modern way of playing football now because back in the day, it was kind of, obviously we know that direct system, that, that route one system that was popular 30 years ago. That was more individual based because you need to, the goalkeeper needs to pick the ball up, kick it long to the striker, and the striker needs to head the ball down to the other striker who scores. Or the winger needs to cross the ball in for the striker to score. That is more individual-based. Whereas this kind of team-orientated total football, in a sense, way that Brighton are playing is going to shock some teams. And it already has. We saw last season it shocked many teams. 
and it's going to shock teams again this season because no one's no one's expected them to do as well as they have been or as well as they have they were last season and no one expects them to expects them to do well this season because of their losses but in terms of Basuma and Cucurella. but we all know that they've they're very smart in the way that they invest so I assume they're going to invest the money from Cucurella well obviously we all know the Basuma money went to Undav and other and these other strikers so it'll be interesting to see where the Cucurella money goes but I just have full faith in Graham Potter and have full faith in that team it, it, it people were like how do you bright and take points against United at Old Trafford like I'll touch on United in a sec but I was I was not shocked in the slightest I knew their quality I knew their quality I know that they've they're a very very well coached football side they're probably top five teams in the league in terms of coached in terms of how well coached they are they're they're better coached than Chelsea they're better coached than United they're maybe they're better coached than Arsenal. I mean, maybe not based on what we saw against Palace, but if 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 you take if it's almost as if if you take every player in that Brighton side and increase their overall football ability by ten percent, they'll be in the top four comfortably. And it's about and 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 we all know how we I mean they've they Graham Potter's taken Adam Lallana. Right, all full credit to Adam Lallana and Danny Welbeck. These rejects from other clubs, and I've just turned them into very, very serviceable players, very good players actually. So I mean, it just shows his quality as a manager. And Brighton need to do everything they can to keep keep his, keep their hands on him because if they just get a little bit more investment, that's all they need. Just they don't, they don't need to completely revamp the whole thing and spend the hundred and fifty billion every summer. If they just cherry pick players here and there, I think they've got a good goalkeeper. I think they probably need another defender, another centre half. I think their midfield is incredibly well balanced. I think Trossard and March on either side, Lamptey as well. I think they're more than capable fullbacks, and they've got versatility. They can play in a three, they can play in a four. I and I mean, if Undaf hits the ground running, who knows what they could do this season? I know, I I know, Welbeck played really well. And he kind of bullied Lissandro Martinez in a sense, which shocked me because I, I backed Lissandro Martinez in ground jewels and in aerial jewels despite his height. But Welbeck just looked very just clean and, and composed going forward, picking the right options. And I mean, I mean, the first goal for me summed, summed everything up brilliantly, Sub, subbed, summed Brighton up brilliantly. You have Trossard on the left-hand side, waiting, being patient, and then finding that ball in behind to Welbeck. All intelligence. It was a relatively simple ball. It wasn't a curving ball. It wasn't a 50-yard kind of hoof up there or like a long ball kind of piercing through three defenders. It was just a, a straight pass into space that was intelligent. The quality, like the difficulty of the pass in itself, like put it this way, if a player was standing where Welbeck received the ball, that's not a difficult pass. But it's the intelligence to time that pass, to time the run, to wait the pass. It was brilliant. And then well back to the back post, cross goal, 1-0. Or might, that might have been the second goal. But I think everyone knows what goal I'm talking about. Summed them up, summed, summed them up brilliantly. Brighton are going to shock many people this season. And I actually wasn't going to speak about Brighton this heavily, but I'm just really fascinated in the way that they play. And yeah. They're just they're gonna be very very good this season as always. I I have no doubts in my mind. So everyone telling me that they'll finish in the bottom half just because they lost Cucurella, and Basuma doesn't really know what Brighton are about because yeah they'll have their off days and yeah I can see them getting smacked five 0 by City and these teams right because what the one thing that perhaps Brighton do leave is space and teams that are capable at exp- at exploiting space. Uh, teams that could hurt them. I can see Spurs hurting them. I can see Spurs putting a lot of goals past Brighton just because Spurs are very capable at, at exposing space. And at times, Brighton do leave space because of how expansive they play. We saw that problem with Leeds under Bielsa. Leeds' as biggest as defeats came against Liverpool, came against City, came against Spurs. They didn't come against Chelsea or Arsenal because Chelsea and Arsenal don't, didn't know how to exploit space. Spurs, especially under Conte, are one of the best teams in the world at exploiting space. Brighton, at times, do leave some space. So I feel like that could be a susceptibility for them there. But overall, I think it'll be a good season for Brighton. And I think this game just proved it. I, I, I predicted it pre-season, and this game just proved it. So 
let's go from Brighton to the other team and the team that I was actually going to speak about in depth, but I've just got carried away speaking about Brighton. Go to Manchester United. Now, it was, of course, Ten Hag's first competitive game in charge. Ronaldo benched, which shocked me because... I mean, let's speak about that before we actually touch on, on, on Ten Hag and touch on the game because that's something that I haven't actually spoken about on this podcast. I'm so confused. I'm so confused. I, I, I spoke about United when I spoke about De Jong and, and these guys. I think it was De Jong and Martinez. Martinez got signed in the end, of course. But w- what is going on there? What is happening? Is it a Ten Hag issue? I don't think it is. Is it a Ronaldo issue? Potentially. I doubt it, though. I feel like Ronaldo's a good enough professional to understand what's best for the team. And is it a board issue? Is it a standards issue? I don't even know what it is. But this all stemmed from Ronaldo leaving a game early, which the only reason this has become an issue is because Ten Hag said, no, I want everyone to say. And the club came out and said, yeah, no, nah, who cares? If you want to leave a game early, that's fine. Once again, fish rots from the head, no? So, if fish rots from the head and your fucking new manager, one of the better managers in world football, is coming out and contradicting what the club has said, it's not a good sign, anyway. It's not a good sign, by any means. But, let's go on to the game. And, what I was very interested to see, coming in for for Eric Ten Hag, was, will he be able to, to make plays better (laughs) that is what I thought because we all know what he's capable of tactically that's fine we all know what he's capable of tactically it's about what he's able to do with players and certain players and by certain players I mean McTominay and Fred because I saw them I saw that they were both starting in midfield and I was like here we go again Groundhog Day I, 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 I just want to touch on that how they haven't signed a central midfielder is staggering to me. Absolutely staggering to me. It makes the best part of no sense at all. I have no idea who's running their transfer business, but it is a shambles. How you have gone 18 months with Fred and McTominay sitting at the base of midfield and have not thought, oh shit, we probably need a better central midfielder, is be is it's actually staggering. Like it's actually unbelievable. They are so not up to it as a double pivot. It is, it's almost embarrassing. Like, I think if you put Fred and McTominay into Wolves or into Nottingham Forest or into Fulham, into Bournemouth, into Everton, into these other teams languaging, languaging, floating down the bottom half of the table, they wouldn't look out of place. You can't have that when you're Manchester United. And put it this way, if you put Rice and Suchek in Bournemouth, they'll they'll transform that team. Rice and Suchek. I'm not even talking about Rodri, Gondawan, and De Bruyne, or Fabinho, Thiago, Henderson, or Kovacic, Conte, Jorginho, or Bentanko, Hoibia, Basuma. It's Manchester United. I'm not talking about fucking some dopey team. Like, it's one of the biggest clubs in the world, and they're still struggling with this. Anyways, sorry. I just uh, cuz I I was uh, I've kind of gone off a couple of tangents here, but like far out, man. How can you not address that issue? Anyway. I was interested to see whether or not Ten Hag could transform McTominay and turn him into prime Javi. Prime Javi. Spoiler alert, McTominay seems to be a lost cause, which I'm not saying it was already known beforehand, but it's good to have some clarification. He started to lower right back. I was in favour of that. He started Harry Maguire and Alessandro Martinez in a centre-back pairing. Malassia? Is that how? That's it. That's his name. He started on the left-hand side of the defence. So that back four kind of went... Oh, no. It was Luke Shaw. Who am I thinking Malassia started? Anyway, Luke Shaw started. So maybe barring Malassia, it was it was um, a pretty, pretty what I expected back line. People saying Martinez is going to play in midfield. Definitely not. Definitely not going to play in midfield. You can't sign him as a midfielder. It won't work. Um, because he doesn't play in midfield. <laughs> he plays a centre-back. 
He's played at centre back. He's hot like he won player of the season at Ajax as a centre back. So why are you gonna play him at DN? Or why are you gonna play him at left back? Anyway. They're gone with Rashford on the on the left, Sancho on the right, and Christian Eriksen as a false nine. I didn't mind that. Um, I actually didn't mind having Eriksen as a false nine instead of Bruno. I actually thought that that could work because you have Eriksen dropping deep and being able to use his creativity. In, because I feel like Eriksen is more he's more of a... How do I say this? Uh, let's use basketball terms. I feel like Eriksen's more of a point guard. He's more of your creator. He's more of your kind of pivot in a sense that like every that all offensive players kind of build around. Whereas Bruno is more of like your finisher like your ender of plays, your kind of guy you want to get the ball to to give the assist or to score, whereas Ericsson's a guy you want to get the pass to the assist, if that makes sense. So I didn't mind that, having Ericsson dropping deep and having Bruno pushing on behind beyond him. I actually thought that was a good idea. And the average position show, I'm not, I'm not going to bring it up here, but um, what the average positions, average positions showed... Ericsson dropping deep, and then Rashford and, and Sancho kind of coming in as two inside forwards, which I think, again, works. I think that works. I think Rashford potentially more than Sancho. I feel like Sancho does do his does do his, does do do his his best work when he's starting in a wider position, but I, re, I like how, they, how, that, how they're using Rashford as a kind of inside forward coming in with a false nine. I, I, do, I do like that quite a lot. And then obviously you had McTominay and Fred in the base of midfield, which... Shock horror didn't work against the midfield of McAllister, Caicedo, Pascal Gross, Adam Lallana. Despite the quality not being substantial, the coachability of those diff- of those groups of players, very drastic. Anyway, um, yeah, I just thought tactic, maybe not tactically, but what the ideas were for each player, I liked. I liked what they did with Rashford and Sancho. I liked what they did with Ericsson and Bruno. I liked what they did with a double pivot. It's just that Fred and Bruno are... I mean, Fred and McTominay are fucking lost causes. So, I mean, you can't help them. The back four was just your standard back four, kind of your fullbacks bombing on Shaw and Dallow being being marauding fullbacks as every modern team plays them these days. So nothing really of note there. But it was just an almost game. Almost. Almost. It almost things happened. Like, they nearly got there. They nearly scored some goals. <laughs> They nearly found that final bars, but it's just quality. And and I am I am seriously of the belief that if you just replace one of McTominay or Fred, it's a completely different team. Completely different team. I, I I'm actually gobsmacked how they're still running around together, because because Fred's not a Fred that you can't play Fred in a double pivot. Fred's Fred's a box to box midfielder. Why are you playing him as a six or even as an eight? He's not good enough offensively to be an eight. He's not good defensively enough to be a six. So he's a box to box midfielder. Right? McTominay, is he a six? No, he's not. He's only a six because he's tall. <laughs> if if Scott McTominay Scott McTominay, who stands at how tall is he? One ninety three centimeters, which is six three, six two, maybe six one if we're being conservative. If he was 5'8", five, 5'9", five, he wouldn't even be anywhere near this Manchester United team. It's because he's built. It's because he's a presence. He's not good enough to be a 6, not good enough to be an 8. They're, they're just playing two average midfielders at the base midfield. That's going to hurt them. And I hate to say it, but like, if they don't sign Frankie de Jong, they're in trouble. They're in big, big trouble. I put United 6th. And I put United sixth, whilst whilst also saying they'll be better than a sixth place team. What I mean by that is that under no, unlike they they will have show glimpses of being in the top four, and they'll show glimpses of being a very good side, but they'll also show glimpses of being a, a tenth place side. So it'll kind of average out to be sixth. I did that on the assumption that they were going to sign a fucking central midfielder or a defensive midfielder because they've needed to sign one for two years. Yet, they're, yet we're still here. Not, not, like, fucking, what, what, what are they doing? Holding their dicks and not signing a defend, not signing a midfielder. They signed a midfielder, the team's transformed completely. Completely. Because we sh- we saw R- Rashford had a poor game, um, didn't have a, sorry, Rashford had a poor season last year, 
Sancho had a poor season last year. Martial, I know he didn't play, but in preseason he looked pretty good. We all saw that Ten Hag has been able to transform that team, all those front, those three players, into playing pretty good football. Because they're coachable. I don't think Fred and McTominay are coachable to the level that Manchester United want them to be. So if you take those two out, even if you take one of them out and play maybe... I th- depends who you sign. If you sign Frankie De Jong, I think you partner him with McTominay. If you sign, if you sign someone like a Zangare, signed a new deal with Ajax, so it can't be him. Um, sorry, not with Ajax, with um, PSV. Who else? Who else could you sign that you could partner Fred with? Because I feel like McTominay has at least some some qualities, in a sense. Whereas Fred kind of, if you, if you sign Matic from 2016, you could partner him with Fred. That could work. But, I mean, we're not in a time machine, so who knows. But I see they're after Kante. I don't ever think Kante is what they need. I don't. I think he'll, he'll improve them, no doubt. No doubt he'll improve them, but I don't think he's the profile of player they need. It's something like a De Jong's the profile of player they need, and I don't ever think he fixes their issue. But I guess I have to wait and see. Ten Hag needs that need that needs that backing. Because we saw even we saw yesterday. Um we saw against Brighton, like we at gl- with glimpses. Glimpses they were a very good team. And with in glimpses they were very dangerous. They just don't have that quality in midfield, which is hurting them. Because Ten Hag system relies so heavily on that double pivot. Last year we saw a double pivot of um Gravner Birch and and someone else whose name has completely escaped me. But Gravner Birch has gone on to Bayern Munich, right? Because he was elevated by playing in that double pivot, which gave him the exposure, which gave him the ability to show his talents because of how important that double pivot is to Ten Hag's system. It wasn't the exact same system because last year he had Haller up front. I think that's what he's going to play with Ronaldo. I think Ronaldo's going to play the Haller role. And that's going to, in turn, maybe put Rashford alongside him, or even Bruno alongside him, giving Sancho that space on that on that um, right-hand side. I think that, that could work. That showed that it has worked, for Ajax especially. So, But it, but it was all off the base of a double pivot. It was all, it was all off the base of an extremely solid and extremely workman-like double pivot. Um, let me just find who the other double partner was. It was... Edson Alvarez, that's who I was thinking of. Edson Alvarez and Gravner Birch. Two players who play, if, if they were in this United team, would be challenging for top four. No doubt in my mind. But it is what it is. They just are lacking that talent, which is holding them back. Because we saw, like I said, that the glimpses were there. They showed glimpses of a very good team, but they also showed glimpses of a very poor team. And that it's not helped by the fact that that, that double pivot's still there. Maybe even Harry Maguire, who I don't think will play when Rafael Varane's fit. I don't know. I can see them moving Martinez to playing as a double pivot, but that's not a that's not a that's only a temporary solution. That's a stopgap. You can't have him there for the whole season because he's not a defensive midfielder. He's a centre back. You sign him as a centre back. It's like it's like Chelsea playing. It's like Chelsea signing Cucurella and playing him as a left winger. He's not a left winger. So um, yeah. That is just my two cents on United. And now, I want to touch on Cucurella and Damsgaard so briefly before we move into who went in two-footed, um, which he returns for this for this year. I'm pretty sure everyone forgot, but it's back. Um, didn't do it for the first two episodes of the off-season because no one really did anything daft when no football was on. But I'll touch on it when we get to it. Um, Cucurella, Damsgaard, going to Chelsea and Brentford respectively. Um, Cucurella was Chelsea's best player when he came on against Everton, which is a concerning but also good sign. Um, and Damsgaard signing for Brentford, risky considering his injury record and considering the reason why he's being allowed to go to Brentford. Um, obviously, I think he has arthritis, I think, which of course is not great. So uh, if Brentford can get that sorted, which, I mean, they took the risk on Ericsson and Ericsson paid him back, paid them back in, in droves. So if if Damsgaard can do even half what Ericsson did, it'll be very good. I feel like he's another perfect player for their system. Thomas Frank will love coaching him, no doubt. So 
Really like that signing for Brentford and Cucurella for Chelsea. Love it. Love it. It's great. You can ship you can ship Emerson and um what's the, what's the other guy's name? Marcus Alonso. They can leave. Piss off. You're not good enough. Get out. Should have gone five years ago. Um maybe not five. Five years ago Alonso was a great was good. Twenty seventeen? No, twenty seventeen it was shit. Conte has it. second season Conte, I think. Who knows? Four. Let's just cover my bases. Three years ago, both of them should have left. Um, so yeah, getting Cucurella in, getting rid of those two, adds depth, adds quality, can play left-sided centre-back as well, can play as a left midfielder, can play as a left winger if absolutely necessary. Very good. Just happy with that. I think it'll, it'll, it'll just do wonders for Chelsea and it'll just uh, give him that extra bit of breathing room and allow Chilwell to take a breather and not rely, and not not hurt the over, overall team's quality by getting rid of Chilwell. So, Yes. Now, let's finish up with who went in. Oh, sorry. I forgot one thing on my run sheet. Bayern Munich and PSG both won by five goals. So, order has been restored, ladies and gentlemen. Um, football is now back well and truly. So, shock horror. The two fucking... What is it? Farmers Leagues. Bayern Munich and PSG winning by a lot. Who, who, who would have thought? Anyway, let's go on to who went into footed. Now... For those, if this is your first episode or if this is your first couple of episodes, if you didn't listen to last season, basically, this is where we go through every week and just kind of dissect, not dissect, just say who did something dumb, who did something daft, who did something just stupid. And whether it's funny or serious or whatever, um, I've gone with, for the first one of 2020, season 2022, 2023, I've gone with Nottingham Forest. And their corner tactic. Now, I'm not going to bring it up here, just risking copyright issues. Just go on Twitter and search, or go on YouTube. It'll probably be on YouTube. And search Nottingham Forest corner tactic. Now, for those who didn't see it on Twitter or didn't watch the Newcastle Nottingham Forest game, basically, they just had every single player for the corner start outside of the box. And then as the, as the corner gets crossed in, all of them run into the box at the same time. Now, that idea... I don't hate, I don't hate that idea, except the cross was the, was the fat side of fucking shit, so it just kind of floated into the goalkeeper's hands, and all the players were looking at each other like, what the fuck are we doing, it was quite hilarious, it was quite funny, I urge you all to check it out, because it will make you laugh, no doubt, Um, it's just the image of Newcastle defenders setting up for a corner with no one around them. It is hilarious. It's something. I mean, we all know we all know Steve Cooper's a little bit of a. I'm not going to say insane, but he transformed. I mean, to be able to transform Forest from what they were to what they are, you need to be some form of a little bit not right in the head, right? So to see him do that and to see him instruct his team to do that, it's quite funny. So I actually didn't mind that. But that is enough for who went into footed for this week. Quick preview of the games. There's a London derby to look forward to. Um, yeah, there's a London derby to look forward to. Chelsea versus Tottenham. The UEFA Super Cup is on Thursday. And any other big games? Negative. No other big games. Just a London derby. Hopefully Chelsea will or I'll cry on this podcast next week. Um, thank you guys very much for watching. Make sh- thank you all very much for returning to the Two Foot Tackle podcast for a new season. If this is your first episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on YouTube. Like the podcast. Subscribe on all the so or listen to it all on the on all the audio platforms. If I could speak, that'd be great. Um, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Anchor. Give it a five star. Give us a thumbs up. It really helps the podcast grow. It really helps more people listen and more people supporting it, which is all the better. Um, so, uh, far out, can't even speak. It's 40, 44 minutes and I can't even speak. Um, follow on all the socials, 2 Foot Tackle Podcast on TikTok and t- Instagram, 2FT Pod on Twitter. Yeah, that's all. That's enough. Thank you all very much for returning for another season. Thank you all very much for watching. Um, see you guys next week. What else do I have to say? Nothing else. All right. See you guys next week. Goodbye.